This is uh, an image which I love because Sally here represents all of us um, in terms of the baggage she's carrying. She's adapting, adapting to life, and uh, she has many burdens. And we adapt until our adaptation processes can no longer cope and adaptation exhaustion sets in and symptoms emerge. Reducing Sally's load and enhancing her adaptive capacity, these are the two key things that all of us do in our, any therapeutic effort is actually either just treating symptoms, which is one aspect, but, or we are reducing adaptive load or we're improving, enhancing functionality. And that can be on a biochemical, nutritional level, it can be on a, on a psychological level, it can be on a, um, a biomechanical level, or it can be a combination of those. Uh, but that's all any of us can do. Uh, we need to consider the unique attributes of our patients and try to remove adaptation demands, lighten the load where Sally's concerned, enhance functionality um, by focusing on the whole person, and remembering, this is important, that any therapeutic intervention, change your diet, more exercise, modify structure, modify anything, is another adaptive load. So we, it's fine-tuning what we ask patients to do or what we do to them to their ability to respond. Because it's very easy to overload an already ad over-adapted decompensating system. Uh, the analogy of a piece of elastic that's stretched so far that anything else is going to make it snap, we've got to try and reduce that stress, introduce more resilience, more elasticity. We need to encourage and educate and explain whatever it is we're asking people to do, not just tell them what to do. Uh, there are biomechanical approaches, biochemical approaches, psychosocial approaches, um, and we we, people need to understand the concept of self-regulation. Patients need to know that all we do to them is to enhance the functionality of self-regulation, homeostasis. We, nothing that you do cures anything. People cure themselves or they improve themselves by their activities. We need a couple of definitions. There's a European definition and an American definition, and we'll just have a quick look at them. It needs to have been around for at least six months to be qualify as um, chronic. Uh, and it needs to be related to the structures related to the pelvis. That's from uh, fall in the European Euro Urology Journal. American definition of, uh, requires that, again, six months. And they talk about it involving the pelvis, the anterior abdominal wall, lower back and or buttocks, anything between the umbilicus and the hips, front, back, sides, inside, is that, that is painful chronically, is chronic pelvic pain. It is not just the um, urogenital uh, area. It, is, it can be uh, irritable bowel. It can be um, pelvic pain of a biomechanical nature, sacroiliac, low back. All of that is chronic. If chronic, is chronic pelvic pain. So anything to do with the content or the Structures that support uh, the pelvis can, be, can meet that definition. Current mainstream appreciation of the CAM uh, influences um, suggests that uh, not only the organs, but also the muscles, connective tissue, that's the fascia, neurological input, all of these need to be evaluated. They talk about this in women, but it involves men as well. And the, the, the text that I put in in the red-brown color um, takes us to the one aspect of this, the susceptibility of the pelvic floor musculature to the development of myofascial pain. Myofascial pain, trigger point activity, we will see is a key element in some of the research that shows what can be done. This is a, a recent paper by Hartman and, and colleagues uh, suggesting that Pelvic floor hypertonicity. We used to think about pelvic um, uh, problems in terms of laxity, in terms of P 
people need to do Kegel-type exercises to tone the pelvic floor. What we're seeing increasingly is high-tone pelvic floor. Um, gymnasts, athletes, people who, do, who work out a lot, uh, excessive amount of activity can lead to um, a short, tight pelvic floor that doesn't function adequately, and that will impact on breathing function and on pelvic pain. So the key points here so far are we need to have, for the, to meet our definition, pain for more than six months, anywhere below the umbilicus and above the hips, side, front, back, or inside, equals chronic pelvic pain. I'm got, every now and then I'll bring up one of these slides, which is like a summary of where we've, we've just been. So you, now you know what we're talking about. Um, we need to understand pain a little bit. Um, there, we, there are lots of misconceptions about pain. That much pain has no pathology. Many people with known pathology uh, report having no pain. So you may have scans which show all sorts of anomalies, no pain, or people in pain and scans and other um, imaging shows nothing. More than half the people with MRI anomalies in their lumbar spine have no pain. Um, objective medical evidence findings don't predict pain. And the most consistent biomarker for chronic pain involves changes in the function and structure of the brain, the cortical areas of the brain, whatever the diagnosis. And this is a, um, uh, the shorthand of that is that pain is in the brain. Does that mean we ignore the periphery? Well, we'll see that that's not, not the case, but in essence, pain is in the brain. Uh, and we call it central sensitization. The, the brain becomes hyperreactive. So if we look at this image here, here you have um, heat or some other pain generator and what the person feels is pain. This is normal. And here we have a feather tickling the person and they feel touch. Those things are separate. We, I touch myself, I feel touch, I don't feel pain. I press hard, I feel pain. When you are sensitized, those same stimuli, heat or whatever, pricking, whatever, would produce a hyperalgesia, hyper excessive amount of pain, and touch, the feather, might lead to pain, allodynia. So it is a, an increased sensitivity. So it's basically that low thresholds of sensory input can activate the pain circuits. So the person's degree of sensitivity has changed, their pain threshold has changed. And this is with all chronic pain, not only pelvic, um, pelvic pain. How do you recognize a central sensitization? They're not only sensitive to pain, but to light, touch, noise, chemicals, and temperature and other things. So current mainstream approaches uh, are mainly biopsychosocial. Cognitive behavioral therapy, helping the person understand and manage their pain um, is seen to be the way forward. And that is very, very effective. But there are other ways. One can reduce that sensitization by reducing the peripheral generators of pain. Uh, that, unfortunately, is not what mainstream uh, medicine is looking at so much, except in, uh, in some countries, like Italy, that is being looked at. So dealing with sensitization, we need to re reduce the, the combination of factors that are um, feeding into the pain. I know this is generalized. This is not pelvic pain, but we're coming to the pelvic bit shortly. Um, deactivate trigger, trigger points, uh, myofascial pain uh, sources is one way. Removing scar irritations, the neurological effect of some scars can, be, can feed into the, the process. Um, improve functionality, spinal and joint. Improve muscle recruitment, strength, flexibility, motor control, etc. Um, and pay attention to the features such as diet, lifestyle, and habits, as we, we all recognize the impact on this. And consider psycho psychological features. This study by Italian researchers, Afaitati and colleagues, is, I think, um, foundational in where I'm taking you next. They showed in a randomized placebo-controlled trial that by dealing with local muscle and joint sensitivity, um, they could reduce central sens sensitization. 
So here we have something which is actually saying, yes, this person has extreme sensitivity, as wherever the pain is, it could be fibromyalgia pain, it could be any other form of pain, chronic headaches, migraine. In this case, let's just stick with pelvic pain. The, by re looking at Sally and removing some of those bundles, some of those pain generators, or modifying them, as well as helping her to cope with the, the stresses of life in general, the pain element changes. Uh, pelvic pain can change. A team effort is, is seen to be ideal. Um, to identify the causes, uh, a complex team effort in the absence of pathology, uh, biomechanical, psycho, psychogenic, biochemical, metabolic, and or neurological features, and none of us, nobody, knows everything about all of this. We need different inputs if we're going to look at the whole person. And they may um, benefit from manual, manual treatment, psychotherapy, biofeedback, neural in interventions, medically, medication, nutrition, surgery, and so on. No two cases are the same. A recent study published this year um, in the uh, Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology clinic, uh, Clinics in North, from North America. Um, this is about adolescents with chronic pelvic pain. And it's, it's interesting to see how this is seen from a mainstream perspective. Um, all sorts of uh, interventions may be needed but involving specialists familiar with gynecological and non-gynecological uh, uh, causes. Um, and apart from mainstream approaches, medications and surgery, physical therapy, trigger point injections, psychological counseling, complementary and alternative medicine is seen to be well integrated in the American model. So the key points are that if central sensitization is a feature, as is common and usual, uh, team approach is best, and that we need to think about, I, I may not be able to deal with the, um, the features involved in this person's chronic pelvic pain. It may be ancient trauma. It may be all sorts of inflammatory processes in the past, leaving internal scar tissue or neurological damage. But you can deal with whatever peripheral aspects you can um, in order to modify pain. Now we move into the link between breathing patterns, the whole respiratory function, and the pelvis. So here we have the pelvic floor with all its uh, intricate musculature. And here, up here somewhere, we have the, oh, way, way up there, we have the diaphragm, all of that stuff. The, there are direct structural links, like here we have psoas muscle, which some of its fascial connections with the pelvic floor uh, uh, take place around here, and there it moves up, and it actually merges with the diaphragm. Uh, quadratus lumborum, which is actually a respiratory muscle in and of itself, it links with the diaphragm. Uh, so the, there are structural and functional links between the way, the behavior of the uh, pelvic floor and the behavior of the diaphragm. Diane Lee from Canada, if you go to her website, dianelee.com, um, in Vancouver has done so much work with this and showing that the evolution of pelvic pain may have started with a breathing pattern disorder. Now, this is a flow chart. Try to remember some of the intricacy of this. Uh, we're going to go through it bit by bit. Stress, the problems of life, traumatic events, unconscious fears lead to anxiety. Anxiety changes the way we breathe. You breathe more rapidly and more upper chest when you're anxious, and when you breathe like that, you, for other reasons, you become more anxious. So there's an intimate inter interchange there. This causes um, sympathetic arousal, the fight or flight mechanism. And uh, from that, you get a whole range of symptoms, which themselves can be frightening and they feed into anxiety. So there's the rapid pulse, the sweating, the panic type of feelings. Um, so that's just the basic stress response. The upper body um, becomes more restricted, um, more held more, uh, fir more firmly, and breathing becomes more rapid. There is a direct correlation between upper chest breathing patterns and head, neck, shoulder type symptoms. And that in itself can feed back into the frightening anxiety pattern. That part is very basic. Now we get to the really interesting bits. 
When you breathe too fast, you lose too much carbon dioxide. As that happens, since carbon dioxide is taken from carbonic acid in the bloodstream, the bloodstream becomes more alkaline. Uh, and a condition known as respiratory alkalosis kicks in. The body tries homeostatically to rebalance that by excreting calcium bicarbonate uh, through the kidneys. So you become too alkaline and the body doesn't like it, so it gets rid of calcium and other ions. Uh, low calcium causes nerves and muscles to function poorly. That changes uh, pain threshold amongst many other things, but it has psychological effects panic and impaired memory may kick in. Physical effects include exhaustion, tingling, cramps, weakness, altered motor control, reduced pain threshold, poor altered balance, etc. And there will be myofascial effects. The diaphragm will respond to um, an upper chest breathing pattern. It's not getting its normal excursion. When you breathe normally, the diaphragm has a real doming effect and flattening effect. When you're breathing upper chest, the poor thing is just fluttering. It get, doesn't get exercise, and that has a direct effect on how the pelvic floor uh, functions. Something else, something called the Bohr effect, B-O-H-R. When you're in an alkaline state, there's a smooth muscle constriction, and the uh, blood vessels and the tubes of the body, that's the gut, the ure urethra, and all of the, that, narrow, smooth muscles constrict. So you're going to have gut problems, you're going to have less, less blood delivered through the blood, the blood vessels. Um, that's going to create ischemia and fatigue, and that uh, is going to lead to the evolution of myofascial trigger points, which actually breed beautifully in the body in an ischemic state where there's too little oxygen. All of that's frightening, and all of that is worse in women post-ovulation because progesterone levels rise, and that leads to faster breathing. Most um, premenstrual symptoms link directly to breathing pattern, and all of this is going to obviously have an effect on the pelvic floor. So I think you can see from this um, flow chart, if you have something like this to show to, to patients, prospective patients, as an educational tool, they can, you can show them why uh, feeling anxious and uh, panicky and or having he head, neck, shoulder pains and or having any of these symptoms may link directly to their breathing and all of that may be associated with pelvic uh, pain as well. I also show people this little mannequin or womanikin, whatever she is, um, and the number of symptoms that can all be linked directly to breathing pattern disorders. Uh, and that, of course, includes pelvic pain. Don't for a moment think I'm saying that all pelvic pain is caused by a breathing pattern dis uh, disorder, which is not a pathology, it's just a habit of breathing. Um, but all pelvic pain will be influenced by it, and it may be in, amongst the causative features. When you breathe upper chest, uh, on inhalation, instead of there being the diaphragm falling down and slightly pushing the abdomen forward and an ex lateral expansion of the ribs, it may all happen at the top in the upper chest. So you, you end up with what's called paradoxical breathing. But you've also got paradoxical um, effects in the, in the bladder area, in the, in the pelvic area. If you have an urge to urinate and you're sitting in a theater, you're not going to want to do it right now, I hope. And so you're going to sort of like retract a little bit and hold things in, and this effect happens. There's a sort of a slight lift of the, of the bladder. But if you have paradoxical bladder behavior and you try to do exactly that, you can have uh, stress incontinence, and you'll, instead of your bladder rising, it will fall and you will wet the, the, the seat, which wouldn't be very nice for anyone. So pelvic floor paradox is... Um, direct correlation with breathing, um, respiratory paradoxical breathing. And um, it's a key feature in the evolution of many pelvic pain problems. Uh, similarly, there's direct link between um, colon spasm, irritable bowel, which again is a pelvic pain, and, uh, and res respiration. That's a study way back in 95. Um, found a direct link between breathing pattern disorders and irritable bowel. Uh, similarly, uh, links between 
core stability and the way the body supports itself and breathing function. Studies by McGill, Hodges, and, and others show that uh, when you breathe upper chest, core stability uh, diminishes and the body does, isn't as stable and low back pain and uh, other, dis other dysfunction can occur. Pelvic girdle pain. Pelvic girdle is the bony structure that surrounds all the stuff inside and that attaches to it. Lots of studies showing the link between breathing pattern and poor pelvic girdle uh, function. This is an Australian study by Smith. Telephone survey of over 38,000 women uh, found a strong association between back and pelvic pain, incontinence, and breathing disorders. They feed into each other. In, in, an enormous amount of um, correlation. This is a, from a Norwegian couple, Haugstad and Haugstad, husband and wife. And I, li I like this quote uh, from them, or these two quotes, that typically women with chronic pelvic pain display upper chest breathing patterns with almost no movement of the thorax in the, or the abdominal area. It's all happening at the top. They also confirm, and this is another, I think, very strong quote from them, and they've done an awful lot of work in this field, characteristic pattern of standing, sitting, and walking, a lack of coordination, irregular, high costal respiration, upper chest, the highest density and the highest degree of elastic stiffness they found in the iliopsoas muscle. And there again, we have, that's the link from psoas through, via the pelvic floor up to the diaphragm. So that's a confirmation. It also tells you something about where you need to, to pay attention if you're a manual therapist of any sort. Um, think about psoas, and we're going to look at one or two ways in which that um, uh, can be done. Key points here, breathing patterns are intimately, structurally, and functionally connected to pelvic problems and must always be considered. So you may think you may be a nutritionist um, or uh, work with stress management. You need to think of the biomechanics. If you are uh, a manual therapist and you don't know about uh, other elements except the structural, you need to think about working with or cross-referring to people who work with stress management and nutrition. It's a team effort. Posture, okay. We'll just look at this very quickly. Neither she nor he could possibly have normal pelvic function. Um, the pelvis is in the wrong place. Uh, the diaphragm, they, neither of them can breathe normally. So the summary here gives you a sense of um, what's short and tight and how that imbalance fi uh, um, fits together uh, to produce um, functional changes in breathing and in pelvic function. So part of what we have to try and do is modify. Now, you're not going to get either this lady or this gentleman back to anything like um, where they were at age 20, but you can improve the function to some extent. This is a part of the body which is, uh, we know about it. This is, this is the uh, thoracolumbar fascia. So down here you have, um, that, 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 this is the sacroiliac joint area here, roughly. And so here you'd have your sacrum. So there's your triangular sacrum. And here you have links down to the hamstrings. So down here somewhere are the legs. And this huge blanket sits from the pelvis up to the shoulders. Shoulders are up here somewhere. And it links to everything. So here you have the sacrotuberous ligaments. And here your gluteal muscles. Um, then you have your internal obliques uh, here and serratus posterior inferior there, you've got your erector spiny connections, latissimus dorsi is up here somewhere. All of these are um, linked to each other. And if, it's, if you're going to have pelvic pain, it's going to be in this area. And if this structure, which links and, and shares load between all of these uh, muscles, is um, dysfunctional in any way, problems arise. So here we have fascial structure. 
it's not moving. My first thought was, okay, how do we get the darn thing to glide again? Because this person has low back pain, and that's pelvic pain. Um, we have to, there are ways of encouraging uh, the production of hyaluronic acid, which is the lubricant that helps it to slide. And so that was my first thought. And when I um, put that in a conversation with the uh, researcher whose film this is, um, Helena Langevin, uh, she was from Harvard, she said very gently, she said, no, Leon, think another way. Here you have a structure which can't slide or glide. Could there be excessive strength tone in all of these structures so the damn thing can't move because it's being pulled in 15 different directions? So maybe the way to get it to slide again and help the back pain is to release the hypertonicity in those muscles. And if that doesn't work, then think about doing something to get the hyaluronic acid level. So we have to see it objectively. Here we have a great example of what not to do if you're um, youngish. Anyone who does too much squatting type activity, and examples are given American football, weightlifting, wrestling, baseball catchers, where you're in a squatting mode uh, in the, your developmental years, you can end up with the problems that this chap had. And you may be able to see a little sort of shadow there. Excessive tone on, obturator, uh, uh, on the obturator muscle has actually created a, um, an increase in, in bone, and that is causing pressure uh, on the pudendal nerve. So this person had chronic pelvic pain. The x-ray shows the altered shape on the left ischial spine. Ischial, ischium is the thing you sit on. Those are your sit, so-called sit bones. Right here, internal structures, muscles in the pelvis, and you can see what sort of stress and strain would be going on in that kind of activity. So we have here the beginning of a sense that what people do, especially in athletics and in repetitive activities, this could be someone in a gym doing this 20 or 30 times a day, four times a week. Not a good idea. Something else they might be doing is sitting on a bicycle. Chronic pelvic pain and cycling are directly linked. Not that cycling in and of itself is necessarily harmful. The shape of the saddle pressing on intimate bits of you and the shape of your seating and your angle of, of riding and whether you ride 10 kilometers or 300 kilometers a week, as some people do, will have a direct effect on, um, in this case, these are studies of erectile dysfunction, but they would be linked to chronic pelvic pain. And the structures that are most at risk there are neural structures which are being compressed and distorted. So we have um, sporting activities or activities that involve repetitive crouching. We have um, possibility that just excessive exercise in and of itself will produce high tone pelvic floor, we have cycling. And the outcome is not good, especially in females. Look at this information here. Um, this was back in 94. 144 female athletes, 28% suffered from stress urinary incontinence. 2001 study, 41% of elite female athletes experienced stress urinary incontinence. Um, in this 2002 study, urinary incontinence in elite female athletes and dancers, very common. Th th this is how common. In gymnasts, 56% people who are involved in ballet, you can see the percentages. Commonly association between high tone pelvic floor dysfunction and dysfunction of the pelvis, part of that can be a pain related. Now for the gender, I saw actually a few more people come in and there were one or two men, which is good because they need to hear this as well. The ratio of female to male here is anywhere between two to one and seven to one, depending on the study you look at. Pro progesterone seems to be the main feature. During the post ovulation phase, carbon dioxide levels drop. We touched on that earlier because you're breathing too fast, because progesterone is an accelerator of breathing and then hyperventilation or other factors, stress, may make things even worse. This just takes us through, let's just look at this top one briefly. As progesterone levels increase, so carbon dioxide levels drop. And that's the correlation. 
direct relationship between how fast you breathe and the dysfunction that emerges from respiratory alkalosis. This uh, comment by Ott in 2006, uh, suggesting that most menstrual cycle uh, dysfunction and pain uh, has a breathing component to it. Pain threshold drops and um, it's a feature that is often ignored. People would be taking medication when they could just focus attention on breathing patterns. So the key points here, biomechanical, fascial and muscular features, as well as gender-related factors, as well as posture and patterns of use, athletics, for example, all need to be considered when we're looking at chronic pelvic pain. This is an excellent book. It's one of the, a book I wish I had written, but I didn't. Um, it's called, written by Anderson and Wise from Stanford University. And they developed a protocol um, of breathing rehabilitation and trigger point deactivation. In, this was mainly for men, men with prostate type um, pain, um, pelvic pain from prostate sources. And so I highly recommend that. It's written for the, lay per the intelligent lay person. Um, I just about managed it. So great book. And their work is, is foundational in some of the work we, get, we do. So here we have someone doing old fashioned skin rolling, now given the grand title of connective tissue manipulation. Um, working on the inner thigh or the low back. And this was a study by Fitzgerald in 2009. That's again, Stanford University in California. Randomized multicenter feasibility trial of myofascial physical therapy for treatment of urological chronic pelvic pain syndromes. There's a mouthful. Excellent study. And they found that by deactivating trigger points, sometimes internally, but as quite commonly externally, using different um, manual techniques, um, they had a, an excellent outcome. If you've not tried doing this with gloves, try it, because you get more traction, and uh, the fingers pull the tissue towards you as the thumbs glide through, and you roll, so you get that sheer force, and any trigger points in there get reasonably rapidly demolished, and that sheer force um, enhances the production of hyaluronic acid, so that's going to improve fascial glide. This is looking at the percentage of 72 patients in that study um, with specific myofascial trigger point tenderness. Internal muscles, which some of you may work with, I do, uh, it's uh, some of the trigger points internally are, they're very easy to treat, and if you haven't trained in it, you need to train in it but it's, it's excellent work. So pubo rectalis, pubo coccygeus, 90% of patients had active trigger points there. You're never going to get rid of them externally, by working externally. They can only be demolished, deactivated, I should say, um, internally. Coccygeus, 34%, and the ani, sphincter ani, 16%. Externally, though, there's a lot you can do. Um, over 50% in rectus abdominis, on the anterior abdominal area. External obliques also over 50% and you can see the rest. So there are different ways of treating them. Some people use manual methods, some people use needling, um, some people use procaine type injections. There are lots of ways of deactivating trigger points. But all of these are going to be feeding into almost all pelvic pain. These are some of the abnormalities that have been found in this group of 49 women referred for pelvic floor physical therapy evaluation. This was also by Fitzgerald. These are just giving the information as to what physical findings. Paniculosis is like that orange peel in the skin, that sense that you can palpate. This was found in these percentages um, of women with pelvic pain. Trigger points were found in those structures. Anatomical changes included diastasis recti, which is this where the central connection to rectus abdominis is broken down through pregnancy or whatever, and so that the muscles that attach to uh, rectus abdominis can't attach, so there's no support there, and you've got a, a gap here. Um, again, Diane Lee's work, go to her work. She spends a lot of time trying to rehabilitate uh, patients with diastasis recti and other dysfunctions. 
So here you have the, the myofascial type dysfunctions uh, where you have chronic pelvic floor problems. These are just some of the areas and the many muscles, let's just take lumbar pain or sacroiliac pain, um, which is this area here. Any of these muscles may have active trigger points that feed into this. Um, and so this is just a map of guidelines. You'd have to search through all of these muscles to find potential trigger points that feed into the buttocks. So the key points, myofascial factors such as trigger points are commonly associated with chronic pelvic pain. Very important. These are some of the methods that are used. Variations on the theme of myofascial release and neuromuscular techniques um, where you get slow, non-invasive, not pain, particularly painful methods to try and change the behavior uh, of structures uh, that are dysfunctional and feeding into the pelvic pain. Uh, this is an, um, an excellent, I mentioned psoas earlier, by holding just above the ankle area and applying gentle traction to take out all the slack and holding that for about 10 seconds and then having the patient retract and try and pull the leg in uh, so that you shorten the muscles while they're being stretched. So you're getting, getting an eccentric contraction. The therapist is still maintaining that traction. The patient is trying to shorten. And then after 10 seconds, the patient releases and you take out a bit more slack and you repeat and you repeat and you repeat. And slowly you get a, a really profound change in psoas behavior. There are lots of ways of treating psoas. Um, I've ended up using this method. Normally, the patient's non-treated leg, that would be flexed to try and reduce stress in the low back. So that this leg would be, have knee up and foot there. But otherwise, this is a, a remarkably, and that will change breathing function almost immediately. Different muscle energy type techniques. Again, quadratus lumborum, I explained. This from the pelvis anchors to the 12th rib, so it is actually, it fires every time you exhale. But from here, it's fascial structures linked to the diaphragm. And from down here, there are links to the pelvic floor. So it's a major contributor to dysfunction. Actual sacroiliac type um, dysfunction, there are lots of different ways. This is just one manual mobilization approach. This is a balanced ligamentous tension, a very non-invasive approach which um, osteopaths use, or some osteopaths use. And many of the uh, pain generators that we need to try and deactivate are actually scars, ancient scars which feed into um, low back and pelvic uh, dys uh, dysfunction. And there are lots of ways of working on scars. These are just some obvious ones. This was described to me by a therapist, ex-dancer, in a workshop I did in Los Angeles a few years ago. And she found with her pelvic pain, not a baseball, as is indicated there, and not on her foot, but on her perineum. I couldn't get a picture of a tennis ball under a perineum, so that's the next best thing. Sitting on a tennis ball, so that it's between the the anus and the vagina, and you're sitting on a floor, a carpeted floor, so the pressure of the tennis ball is coming up, and you gently roll backwards and forwards, so the pressure, you're actually creating an, uh, a slow stretching of the perineum. Um, and many people with pelvic pain find that, especially if they are youngish, have had um, the experience of too much ballet, Pilates, wrong sort of Pilates, um, gymnastics and whatever, and have a high tone, short pelvic floor, and are suffering from stress incontinence as those athletes were, this can often be a savior. Manual approaches have been shown, therefore, to offer significant benefit in the management of chronic pelvic pain. So there's growing feedback and evidence for biofeedback, myofascial trigger point release, exercise methods, relaxation techniques, and so on in chronic pelvic pain but we also need to look at nutrition. So there are studies which show that probiotics can help. Uh, lots of studies that I've just given you a couple of um, citations here. 
specifically in uh, urological dysfunction. Generally diet, reasonably obvious. The, the nutritional um, approaches are uh, summarized there. Omega-3, fatty acids, vitamin E, B1, B3, magnesium, uh, all of those will help. Di anything that irritates uh, the pelvic area, so the dietary acid load should change, as much water as possible. These are some of the irritants, alcohol, carbonated drinks, caffeine, spicy foods, sore palmetto for men with prostate pain, pollen extracts and quercetin have been shown to be helpful. Uh, pollen extracts in particular, uh, compared to placebo, pollen extracts significantly, significantly improve total symptoms, pain and quality of life in patients with inflammatory uh, pelvic pain without side effects. That was in a study in 2009. So pollen extracts, I think, are very useful. Saw palmetto, quercetin, uh, naturally occurring bioflavonoid, helpful, inhibits histamine release. One of the effects of overbreathing is to have elevated histamine levels uh, and because it degrades more slowly in a superalkaline respiratory alka uh, alkalosis setting. So if you have high histamine levels, you're likely to have more reactive reactions, uh, sensitivity allergic reactions, and quercetin will help to um, inhibit that. This just talks of the quercetin having multiple mechanisms of action, uh, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and antibacterial. So highly recommended quercetin, saw palmetto, pollen extracts. Uh, this is the mucopolysaccharides, uh, glycosaminoglycans, these are going to help the fascial function, but they're also going to help bladder function. And hyaluronic acid, chondroitin, aloe vera type substances will assist with that. And berry juices, uh, if there are infections. But most of the dysfunctions we're talking about are not infection related. They are simply dysfunctions as per the early start of what we talked about. Uh, the multiple influences of biomechanics and stress, etc. So a variety of nutritional and botanical approaches can be useful. Resilience. Resilience is a term uh, back to that stretched elastic. How do we restore resilience? So the body is self-regulating, self-healing, and we need to focus on what are the factors that are exhausting its adaptation potential. How vulnerable or susceptible is the individual? How much can I do or ask the patient to do without overloading their adaptive capacity? These are critically important, obvious thoughts, um, but they're often neglected. So you don't, someone who's already in the Sally situation, overloaded, you don't ask them to change their diet, improve their exercise, take this, do that, and then manipulate them or stick needles in them. It's too many different things happening. Each Change is another adaptive demand. Uh, the art of healthcare is to appreciate where the patient is in the adaptation spectrum. That's the art of it. There are skills associated. And to make therapeutic choices that fit with the individual's ability to respond. All therapeutic interventions impose additional adaptive load. We've touched on that. Some, we have to recognize that some things are fixable and some things are not. Some things can only be contained or maintained but within that framework, we can help. So it's where is this patient and what can we still do for them? Strain on elastic can be eased. It may remain fragile. We need to do that without creating a snap. Chronic pelvic pain frequently benefits from an integrated approach that involves both mainstream and integrated uh, methods and approaches. This is my dog. Um, that's a meadow below our house in Corfu. I live in Corfu. He lives in Corfu. My wife also lives in Corfu. <laughs> but uh, she didn't want her picture shown. So that's, his name is Dumbo. When he runs, his ears flap. Okay, this is to highly recommend that you think about either of these two books. I don't like self-promotion, but the books are worth having. Yes, questions. The one up there. Uh, the situation is with a woman who's not been pregnant and has had chronic 
pain in the right uh, groin area. Reasonably active. Age? A fifth, mid 50s. Okay. Had this for about seven years. Has. Medical diagnosis? No medical diagnosis. Very, sh very sharp pain on initiating movement okay. that goes once she's walking. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I can only give, I can guess. Um, you, you were here when we were talking about uh, the myofascial pain. Yes. Uh, firstly, I would start with posture, breathing, history or any trauma, but you say that that's not there probably. So how well does she breathe? How much is her diaphragm working? How well is it working? Uh, what is her posture like? We would start with there. And then what um, evidence is there of myofascial trigger point activity that might be feeding in? So where is the pain? Then we looked at the map and we say, okay, if it's pain there and it's trigger point related, we don't know if it is, this is where we would look. And if we find, sometimes you'll find a trigger point that reproduces the symptoms immediately. Sometimes they're internal, sometimes they're external. So from a biomechanical bio perspective, I'd start there, and then I'd do whatever I can about general stress management and does she walk enough, does she sleep enough, does she, mm. what is she eating? So that, that would be my approach. Thank right? you very much, that's Thank very you. helpful. Anyone else got a question? There's one right down here. Just got a patient that is really standing out during this lecture. Um, she's only 15, uh, 14, so she's an adolescent. Um, there's lots of things going on ho and at home, including a sibling with autism, um, and chronic pain has been a massive problem with this. Where is the pain? Um, all over, so it's central sensitization, basically. Okay. But I'm just wondering, in the situation where you can't change the factors that are going on at home, where do you sort of start? So you can't change the baggage. You've yeah. got to try and improve the functionality, and that may require... At 14, she can understand. She could work on her breath. She probably breathes very badly. She, uh, uh, so you start with something there very gently, very slowly, something, some non-invasive treatments like myofascial release and or um, crani craniosacral type work, which has a calming effect, not trying to uh, do the skin rolling, which would be a <laughs> type effect. I, you've got to start with what you can do, but she first has to understand the process. At 14, you can take her through... You're, this is happening, and, and these are some of your characteristics, and these are the symptoms. She has to learn how to do what she needs to do, and that's going to be about posture and breathing and sleep and exercise and so on. Great, thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm by no means an expert at this, so it might be a silly question. Um, the sitting on the tennis ball, yes. um, I have someone, a man with pelvic pain and he fits your description I mean he rode as an adolescent all through school and at Oxford and Ro um, rowing would be another one yes yeah, I didn't absolutely. mention absolutely um and does a lot of heavy work and and then now sits down all day for his job um does the sitting on a tennis ball work for a man it might well it'll either work or not work it won't do any harm okay. um but my experience with men who've been doing too much work in a gym or have that sort of background uh, is that internal work is required. There are going to be trigger points. It sounds grim. You, he needs to, uh, uh, you have a chaperone there, he accepts it, which he probably would if he's in enough pain. You're wearing gloves, you use a lubricant, you go internally in the, in, in the rectum, and you don't have to, you can't go very far, the fingers are only so long, but you just search gently around for anything that he'll go, yeah, when you touch it. It's a trigger point. The amount of pressure is in grams, it's not more than that. You hold the trigger point, you do very light stroking, just two or three. You might be able to apply a little bit more pressure. You ask him to, can you contract where, that bit of you around my finger so you get an isometric contraction. When he releases that, stretch a bit more, and that's enough for the day. And you'll see the trigger point. Next time you go visiting, um, you'll find that perhaps the pain is, it sounds grim, but good God, it works. And it works so quickly. Men do not enjoy it. They hate it. But if he's in enough pain, he'll say, yes, please, and he'll bring his wife or his whatever to sit and watch you like a hawk. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK. Sorry to be so basic, but it's, it's fine. Yeah, one more question. Any experience with treating endometriosis? No, yeah, you, this, there is a different... Uh, the answer is the end effects thereof... You don't treat the endometriosis. You can treat the pain associated with it. 
But it is, that's a pathology. And, um, so let me rephrase the question then. <laughs> have you ever experienced that people present with pelvic pain who may have also come with a yes, diagnosis? Yes, you can, you can often help the pain. You, I don't think we can do much. You, can, you could try and get the body to function better and deal with the inflammatory processes and so on. I, I don't treat the endometriosis. There are American naturopaths who have protocols where they use, uh, which I don't go into. They're just too complex for me. But yes, you can. And the things... So what we're working perhaps with the pain aspect of it rather than the actual condition. Okay, uh, one, one very last one. You have one minute. You said that there was either um, pelvic floor with low tone or high tone. What are the key identifying characteristics? A lot of it is about age. It's, it's yeah. a very good question. Uh, if you're talking about someone in their 20s, 30s, 40s, it's probably high tone, unless they've had six or seven babies, in which case it could be low tone. Or, or some sort of damage. But obviously in older, older people, there's more laxity, more likelihood of laxity. Although that's not a, not a sort of an infallible observation. I have had several elderly people with high tone pelvic floor when they have taken up uh, Pilates in middle age and been taught badly and are not working with the breathing rhythms and Pilates. Pilates is not harmful. Bad Pilates is. And then, then you, they may develop a high-tone pelvic floor even in older age.